Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. He is Sean Fitz. It's our final episode before we get to Christmas. Hope everyone's doing well this holiday season, whether you're traveling around or staying put. We've got Penn State football to look forward to. Just around the corner, Arkansas, number 21 in the country against the Nittany Lions on New Year's Day down in Tampa, Florida. Happy to report that we are heading down that way along with Mark Brennan um, and his daughter, Grace, who's going to be shooting photos that she done for, that she's done for us all year. So look for uh, complete coverage of the Outback Bowl game week next week when we get down there. I'm getting down Tuesday. Sean, you're making a pit stop in Orlando for some All-America game action, some recruiting-related stuff. So we got a lot coming your way. This is going to be more big-picture conversation. But before we get to that on this episode, roster moves, expected roster moves, and we'll start with someone – who's not going to be down in Tampa for this matchup, at least on the field. Ellis Brooks, his college career is done. This is one we've been anticipating. This was one that essentially leaked uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, and now it's official. Yeah, now it's official, and uh, two starting linebackers now not playing for the Nittany Lions. That's going to be that's going to be a problem against a team that runs the ball over sixty percent of the time, like Arkansas. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how Penn State plugs those gaps. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see playing five defensive backs against uh, uh, a team like Arkansas, especially without their top wide receiver. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that, that's going into this, but Ellis Brooks, his college career is done a multi-year starter for Penn state, Penn state's leading tackler in 2021, uh, a solid presence in the middle. Um, and he's going to focus on his health. He played the last half of the season in, with a cast on his right arm. Um, I believe he re-injured that late in the year as well. Um, so he, there was a lot, a lot going on with that, but, uh, Brooks is going to get healthy and is going to start preparing for the draft, uh, I believe down in Florida. Played a ton of football for this program, came in as a four-star prospect, um, was a two deep guy a few years back in the last couple of seasons as the starting middle linebacker for this squad, Sean. And I, I felt like he certainly made strides like much of this defense under Brent Pry from 2020 to 2021. I don't think there was really an area of the field that didn't take a step forward uh, from the 2020 season. But Ellis Brooks has some film out there that is going to be helpful to him. There's also going to be questions about him and the, what the athletic profile looks like projecting to the NFL. But um, a guy that they're going to be missing, a, a, a vocal presence for this program, a productive presence, and certainly against the run is where we've seen him have some big moments during his career uh, of late. And with him out of the way, that means Brandon Smith and Ellis Brooks, both in the box linebackers, are now out of the picture for you against this Arkansas squad. As you said, you'd think the indication is they're going to try to run the ball and run it again and then run it a third time against Penn State. Kobe King's at four games, so if he plays – he burns a red shirt. I mean, is this just straight up Charlie Catch here? Go get it. Is this Car Curtis Jacobs show off your versatility and sliding down Jonathan Sutherland to the Sam? Is it a combination of those things? Um, it, it's a tough spot that they are in and probably uh, position wise, uh, they're up against him more than anywhere else in the field right now. Yeah, I think it's going to be the second one. I think you're going to see Curtis Jacobs slide down in the box and Sutherland play some Sam. Um, I mean, that's pretty much what you were trying to uh, when you're piecing it together at the end of the season. I believe what Jacobs missed the Rutgers game due to the yeah. illness. So you, you saw a lot of Sutherland there. So he's got some experience there. Obviously, their size is not uh, what Brandon Smith and Ellis Brooks bring to the table. But uh, Jesse Lucetta, very important. He was playing middle linebacker when we were at practice on Friday. So you hope he's going to come through and, and play in the game. And, and you know, that's just going to cause a trickle-down effect there. You're missing uh, – you know, if you're missing a starting linebacker, you move Lucetta there. Then you're missing a starting defensive end. You're probably going to be missing AK. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on uh, in terms of – moving parts on that defense and I, I don't think any of them make it better and you know you probably still have more of those announcements to come so uh this defense is is going to look different than the the last one that rolled out there Penn State had a phenomenal year on defense but you're missing two linebackers you're gonna have to move around uh, a couple of defensive ends brisker you know we're not really expecting brisker either so uh it's it's there's a lot going on right now and it's uh it's it's tough to prepare for. I'll say that um, you mentioned Charlie catcher. Um, Tyler Elston might be in the mix there. The two freshmen, Kobe King and Jamari Budden are both uh, sitting at that four game. And by the way, uh, that, that, that needs to be addressed with the NCAA. The bowl games should not count against that, that eligibility standard, especially when you see as much movement as we've seen, not just at Penn state, but in this whole, uh, this whole bowl season guys opting yeah. out, you're going to have to, plug gaps with true freshmen you're going to cost them a year not that red shirting is is you know a, a modern day thing or anything like that but you still would like to keep those guys eligible if possible so be interesting to see how much kobe king we see if if any i know they were trying to preserve that shirt but you're in that situation and james franklin's 
talked about it before. I'm sure he's going to talk about it in the in in, in any of his pregame uh, press conferences. They used to be in situations where they had to burn guys for the bowl game, and that's just unfortunate to see, especially as I don't want to say as hollow, but as 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 watered down as these bowl matchups have become because of the opt outs and things like that. Um, it just it kind of sucks for those younger players. But yeah, they're going to be patching holes and trying to figure out what's going on. More Daquan Hardy, probably more um, J- uh, Johnny Dixon, maybe uh, and maybe bringing in a third safety. Maybe Jalen Reed gets some time in there. We always thought he he might be a Sam guy. So um, just kind of like we said with the offensive line in our first episode this week is you're trying to get to that finish line so you can hit reset and, and enter 2022. Defense right now, because of the opt outs, because of wondering what the availability availability looks like for some guys here because of the redshirt status and be it's because of potential more opt outs. You're kind of just trying to say, find 11 guys and piece it together and make it work. And you're asking uh, Anthony Poindexter to do that. And you're asking uh, linebackers coach Joe Lorig to do that. And there are just a lot of things happening on the defensive side of the football. And of course, this was the area where Penn State could hang its hat on top 10 nationally and points allowed per game. There's a reason why Brent Pry got a, a, an excellent opportunity at the power five level. Lucetta feels like a, a crucial piece here, Sean, um, you know, telling us last Friday he plans to play. Um, you know, one of those things that you want to see this through uh, and, and see what the roster looks like down in Tampa, because Jesse Lucetta, whether it's at Mike or defensive end, as you said, feels like they're going to be uh, potentially extra thin in each of those areas uh, so Lucetta really, in a lot of ways, at the crux of what this defensive front seven is going to look like from a lineup perspective and from a depth perspective. Yeah, and he's in Canada right now, so I don't know how that's going to play into it. Uh, I guess he went home for for the holidays, so hopefully he's back with the team and can travel down to uh, to Florida and, and play in that game because it's such a a key factor for this Penn State defense. And and you know we we know what we've seen from him as a linebacker in the past, and not a world beater by any stretch of the imagination there, but such a valuable part of this defense in the role that he played this year. So uh, yeah, they're, they're going to need him. I mean, Tyler Elston, uh, high hopes for him in the future, but I think the future is, is emphasized there. Charlie catchers played in a bunch of games, but never as a featured guy. So, um, you know, you're, you're thin at linebacker to begin with, you lose your two starters. That's quite a drop off there. And I'll be interested to see how, how Penn state's able to handle it. Okay. The present is, is pretty chaotic right now. You mentioned the future though, and Jair Brown's a part of that for Penn state in 2022 like ellis brooks opting out jair brown confirming he's going to stay put in 2022 uh, is something that we've anticipated for some time you've heard that on the podcast now that it's official sean though penn state returning uh giving anthony poindexter a guy who led penn state with six takeaways giving manny diaz a playmaker on the back end fifth college season coming up it will be his third at penn state He was a second teamer back in 2020. Of course, this year, stepping up, taking the job and running with it out of preseason camp, along with his former Lackawanna uh, college teammate, Jaquan Brisker. Going with that Brisker blueprint, you wrote about it earlier this year. Jaquan faced a similar decision um, after a strong first year as a starter. Um, I think we've talked about this, Brisker projecting as, as, as a different profile talent right now when you look at the NFL scouting evaluation. But for Brown, Third team pick by the coaches uh, in in the postseason All Big Ten um, team that you can build on that second first team status, put yourself in the conversation as one of the best safeties in one of the top conferences in the country. That's a long way to go from a guy, and I'll say it again, did not have a single Division One or Division Two option for college football when he walked out of tr- uh, Central uh, Trenton High School. So a long way, a long journey. Yeah, a great, a great story. You know, this is one that we've been covering. We've been, um, you know, on him since that camp when he when he earned his offer. Actually, before that, he he visited for an unofficial visit. Uh, I believe uh, Norval Black was there. Feldarius Payne, who's now at, at Nebraska, was there as well. Um, but Brown was a guy that 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 turned heads at camp, and I think a lot of people were skeptical about that offer because. Um, you know, at that point, junior college players at Penn State had not made the impact that Brisker and and, and now Brown have. Um, so you know, skepticism was probably acceptable at that point, but really made him turn around. Great story for, for him. Great story for Penn state. If you're trying to recruit those junior college ranks as they are, um, he turned around and, and, you know, you weren't sure coming off of the, the limited glimpses we got from him in 2020, you weren't sure if he was able to put that together. 
and he was awesome. I mean, he was he was in terms of expectations versus uh, you know some of the, the other guys in that defense. I mean, he he took it and ran with it. Ended the Wisconsin game with a pick. Ended the Maryland game with a pick. Six six takeaways. You don't see that from many Penn State defensive players. Yeah. At least that that consolidated number. I mean, you see Penn State has gotten some turnovers, but not not like that. So four interceptions, team high. Two uh, f- two fumble recoveries. Um, so he was all over the place. Uh, made some game changing plays for him. Um, third team All Big Ten Big Ten pick, as you said. But I think his leadership is going to be vital for Penn State. They're trying to build this one back next year. Of course, no Brent Pry, but you you get Anthony Poindexter back. You have the opportunity to to build around Brown in the back end, just like you build around Jaquan Brisker in the back end. Uh, Keaton Ellis is back there. Jalen Reed, probably the next guy's up. You'll see about getting a fourth safety is something they definitely have to figure out who that guy is. But uh, I think it's the right decision. I mean, you you obviously never going to question a kid that, that wants to come out and, and make the best decision for his family, but you saw what Brisker could do. The blueprint is there. Um, I don't think he's going to go as high as Brisker. Brisker at 6'1 plus, a little bit more athleticism there. But Brown is a guy that can find his way into that draft and and find his way up that draft board. And I'm, I'm happy to see him blossom and take it, uh, uh, take it to the next level because – as you talk to him, as I talked to him, you interviewed him on the podcast last year. I mean, this this scholarship offer was was a lifeline, basically. I mean, to get him where he wanted to be in life and and beyond where where his dreams were in life, um, you know, really took it on, uh, took it on, and and not all those guys pan out. We saw Norval Black already hit the uh, the portal from Lackawanna there, so it's uh, the the hit rate is not a hundred percent. But when you hit on a guy like Brisker, you hit on a guy like Brown, you're feeling pretty good about the uh, the methods that you're using to to get your safeties. There are dozens of guys on the Penn State roster that you scroll through their Twitter timeline, you'll see 20 to 30 posted things about the offers, and Sean's drinking out of a reindeer mug in his festive Christmas sweatshirt right now, in case you're not watching. If you need more motivation to follow us on YouTube at Lines. It's a moose mug, sir. It's a, mo- it's a moose a mug. Moose mug. Right. I'm not even going to venture to guess what's in there, um, but happy holidays to you, coffee. Sean. just Sorry. Okay. That's, <laughs> well, that's disappointing, but getting back to, to, to Jair Brown. It's 11, 20 in Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to Jair Brown, Sean, um, you know, retaining him is is goes beyond the box score. Like you said, I think he's going to be in that conversation uh, to be a captain for this team next year. Um, certainly in the background, if you watch in the games, he is someone who's in his teammates' ears. He's flying around with the football. He brings a lot of energy. And when you're transitioning to new leadership from a, a, a you know, the, when the voice of your defense of leadership is, changes from Brent Pry. Uh, over to Manny Diaz. I don't know how big of a change that will be. We've talked about a lot of the defensive philosophy is going to stay in place, but to have the peer leadership in place, PJ Mustfer would be an absolute huge win to have him up front. But now in the back end, not sure what else you're going to have. Maybe some moving parts in the defensive backfield. But this is one that I think stabilizes the situation for you in, in some regard from a personnel standpoint. At the same time, What's he look like without Jaquan Brisker playing next to him? Because it's going to be maybe Keaton Ellis, maybe Jalen Reed, guys who don't have that experience. And certainly we're not all American caliber players this year. So you know, that's the next step for, for, for Jair Brown to prove himself is to do it without playing alongside Brisker. Because obviously his early success at Lackawanna, uh, that was playing with Brisker. Early success here at Penn State, same deal. Um, he, he did fine on his own at Lackawanna. As he has addressed several times, the Big Ten is a different beast. Yeah, it helps to have an All American beside you when you're a safety. Um, so he he's a guy that you know you, you shy away from one guy, and the other guy is going to benefit. And they were perfectly happy with that that scenario right there this year. Um, it was it was you made an interesting point with with the change of defensive coordinator. I mean, we've expected Brown to come back for a while. Did not walk with the the other seniors at Senior Day. Um, just the you know this has been something that we've been waiting for the announcement to, uh, for a long time. But you change coordinators all of a sudden you have questions. I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't have expected Brown to leave, but you know, that, that sort of throws it up in the air a little bit more. So good to see him make that, uh, make that commitment, make that announcement and get things going. We saw him at practice, uh, you know, on, on Friday, leading the safeties through, that's going to be an interesting one next year because you've got uh, those guys that you mentioned, Keaton Ellis and Jalen Reed, Enzo Jennings hit the portal, never did anything here. Tyler Rudolph hit the portal there. Be interesting to see if Saki Wheatley is, is a guy that finds himself at safety and, and Tyrese Mills still up in the air as well. So uh, finding that fourth guy, I know it doesn't sound important, but uh, that's something that they've been trying to stress for the last couple of years is you want to have four of those guys ready to go because, you know, Brisker was in and out of games hurt. Uh, other guys have been banged up as well. Um, so you want to have as many of those guys as possible and you know given 
the coaching change and everything going on, having a veteran presence and a leader back there like Brown is, is huge for this Penn State defense in 2022. And you, you talk about Jair Brown waiting to see what happened with defensive coordinator. How about him tiptoeing around the Anthony Poindexter reports and, you know, waiting to see what was going to come from that. This was maybe maybe not as much of a done deal as we thought. And, and, and maybe this is exactly where you read between the lines with some of the things James Franklin told us during and after the defensive coordinator search. He said one of his top priorities was being transparent with his recruiting class and most importantly, with his current players on the roster about what the new defense was going to look like and trying to make them understand that it was not going to be a rebuild job. It was going to be a, a lot of the same deal. And look, when you're trying to, to talk to guys who are maybe on this fence and there's a few of them on defense, that has to be part of your approach if you're James Franklin. Absolutely. And you're going to lose uh, at, at least Tariq Castro Fields and Brisker. And now two, two of those linebackers, uh, Derek Tangelo up front, Epikidi. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of big time, uh, productive guys that are leaving you this year. So Manny Diaz has, has his work cut out for him, but uh, you get as many of these guys and get as many of these announcements as you can get and, and run with it. Cause it, you know, some talented guys that are expected to come back. Shifting from players we may or may not see down at the Outback Bowl to guys that we're definitely looking forward to seeing in a more expanded practice reps, perhaps down in Tampa and maybe setting the stage for a big, big spring schedule. Quick position by position look here, Sean, some postseason progress reports that we're curious about. Um, and, and there's a lot of them on both sides of the ball. We kind of covered some on defense just now. So let's start on offense. And, and my takeaway is Taquan Roberson has entered the transfer portal, um, as we expected, maybe a little bit earlier than expected, but it, it has happened. Uh, Sean Clifford is sticking around, but this should be a very month, and I imagine it has been and will continue to be down in Florida for Christian Veyu when it comes to handling his practice snaps. They looked, it was bare out there on the practice field the other day, just all around, but specifically with the quarterbacks, it was it was Clifford and Veyu throw for throw, just kind of you go, you go, and then back to the front and back, you know, that there was no, I, we didn't even see Mason, I think Mason Stahl was down at the other end uh, throwing for the the, the scout team, um, but they're getting Tyler Warren. Work, Tyler know. Warren's getting closer and closer to ending Stop. up over there. <laughs> Stop. Um, no, but if uh, if they're in a situation, um, you know, where where you were expecting Clifford to get fewer reps, and by that I mean like legitimately cut his reps and give the younger guys time, they just they can't do it. They don't have the the manpower to do it. So I expect Veyu to get more reps and and get some some more live reps with the first team, which he definitely needs. And um, you know, it's good for him to to get a jump and get a leg up on those guys that are coming in in January when they have four guys on scholarship in the spring. Um, so, I mean, it, it's going to be valuable for him to, to work through this bowl time to get a sense of how things go. Cause you remember last year, no bowl practice, nothing like that. Um, you know, not that they would have gotten more than a week of practice if they did accept a bowl. I think that's what a lot of people forget is this isn't a 15 session or whatever you have between the end of the season and the start of the bowl, like a typical year last year, it was just, you get done playing your Illinois championship week or whatever, and then figure your, find yourself in the, uh, Mine key car care bowl or whatever it would have been um, a, a week later. So this is a different situation. It's a lot of reps to go around. And I think he's really going to have a chance to benefit from it. You may have heard a time or two on the podcast that Penn State's 2021 approach in the quarterback room was not ideal, and it ultimately came to surface it, during the season. But silver lining We're the, here, we're the only is, ones reporting that, by the way. Yes. Silver, <laughs> silver lining, Sean, is it seemingly turned into a great individual first year for Christian Veyu. He got in here. Got a lot of spring reps with the new offensive coordinator, who, by the way, when he signed with the program, Kirk Shiraka was his guy. So this was a quick turnaround for him. Uh, came in, got familiar with Mike Yurcich, and I think by the end of this, certainly impressed Mike Yurcich and uh, some of the things we heard from the offensive coordinator. And then when he got his chance to get in the game and play three full quarters against Rutgers, when his team is shorthanded and he's missing guys up front, uh, he kept that team. You know, there was no pre-snap penalties. There were no ill-timed uh timeouts or delay of games and you know he kept things on track 270 yards three touchdowns no turnovers i think people said okay the kid's got some wheels D -d wasn't quite sure about that and people started to understand that's part of his game and i have to imagine christian who i think you and i come talking to him probably identify he's a motivated kid maybe got a little bit of a chip didn't get a chance to finish his high school career the way he wanted and now i'm sure he's hearing that well it's sean and then there's these two freshmen coming in and people are very quick to skip over the other guy, even though just about a month ago he was out there doing some special things in Beaver Stadium. So he's going to be fun to follow right now. And and, right, and I think for him, every single snap he can take in front of Mike Yurcich when he's not standing side by side with Drew Aller and Bo Perbula 
is significant. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, you know, probably a little bit further along than I expected based on that game action that we saw. And I know that there were things that he did that he couldn't get away with against other teams, no offense uh, to our, our co-host and producer here. Um, but uh, for, for him to come in as a true freshman to, to really get it done is uh, it says a lot about his competitive nature and, and that's what he's going to need in the spring. I mean, he's high Lance. That's what he's going to need in the spring. So um, it, it, it's really a situation where he can benefit from this and put as much space between him and Drew Aller and Bo Perbula before they get here. Cause I, he's not see, unseating Sean Clifford anytime soon. So I think you're just going to have to go into it and say, you know, get get up. I don't want to say pole position because I'm not a NASCAR guy or whatever, but get as far up in the qualifying as you can, and then and then go with it. Uh, there's a bunch of names we can go through on the offensive line. There needs to be a bunch of names. There needs to be progress from young players in that position room right now, heading into the off season. Uh, I'm going to throw a bunch your way. Uh, a, a couple, uh, one of which we saw late in the season, Landon Tengwall, the top rated 2021 signee, Olu Fashano. We didn't see it all late in the season, which. He's certainly somebody that needs to come up uh, at tackle. Jimmy Christ got involved a little bit on the varsity practice field late. So did Ibrahim Traore because of the numbers that were dwindling with the flu symptoms. And then inside, Nick Dawkins, Golden Israel, Achumba. Hey, time for somebody to make their move. It's got to be a few players. And Phil Troutwine under the microscope. Man, he, he's got to come up with a plan that, that you go into next spring and you feel like at least a few of these guys you're hitting on and they're going to be able to contribute for you in 2022. Yeah, you got that last uh, Lime Grover class there with the five guys. And that's uh, that's going to be one of those ones that we're going to be watching for a long time for development. Uh, Fashanu, with, if, if Walker's not playing and we didn't see Walker at practice on uh, on Friday, Fashanu's going to have a chance to start. I think he's head and shoulders above that group um, in terms of what we've heard um, for development and things like that. But Jimmy Chris, we saw some of him at the end of the season this year. Um, you know, you, you always need tackles. You always need big guys. And, and I think he can use another off season before we can judge where he stands, probably pushing for the two deep next year. Um, Dawkins has been in that mix uh, for center. And, you know, you've, you've flowed a through a, a flowed a few guys through there um, with Scruggs, with Miranda, Blake Zoller has been in there. Um, but Dawkins is a guy, I think, uh, with another offseason can push for that too deep. Um, still up in the air on, on Israel Chumba. He's battled injuries uh, since high school, basically. Um, when he's been out there, he's been with the varsity at times playing guard. Um, and then I think Treyor, that's a long way to go for him um, to, to cracking into that. But uh, we will see where he is in the spring because all these guys, um, you know, it, th their careers have been, have been anything but normal. But the spring practice is, is a spot where they can really um, achieve. And, and with bowl practice, I mean, if you're not if you're down Walker and and, and those veterans like Miranda and, and Scruggs are cutting back on their reps, you've got an opportunity to get in there and, and maybe turn some heads. And, and with Landon Sengwall, reminder, did not play football his senior year of high school because of the pandemic. And, you know, then on the shelf for the first 10 games on the shelf at, from an injury standpoint, but relegated to the practice field. He's a guy that I feel, Sean, really going to be curious where he breaks through. But um, I, I like his chances to push for a first team role. Not sure what position it's going to come in in 2022, but um, his opportunity to play, I, I'm very curious to see how this month goes and uh, Phil Troutwine um, and also the entire coaching staff as they look at a guy like him at Caden Wallace. And, and, and Caden isn't really in that young guy conversation anymore. He's progressing toward team vet after two years as a starter. But this is part of that conversation at offensive line. Are you getting those long looks? Are you reviewing the practice scrimmage film? What have you? to get every kind of data point you can collect to see who is our best fit at tackle, who is our best fit at guard, because the right fit was not found in 2021. You can't have a repeat performance. You got the transfer portal looming. That needs to be addressed. But there isn't some kind of Superman scenario where this, this room is going to get saved by external force. You're going to have to do a lot of it internally. Yeah, and that's uh, that's unfortunate for a lot of people because anytime you talk about the the offensive line lately, it just turns into a dumpster fire in terms of uh, you know everybody's frustrated with it. I'd I'd love to see him play Tangwall. I mean, to be honest with you, just mm -hmm. uh, editorializing here, whether it's guard, whether it's tackle. Um, I think he's a talented kid. I think he's ahead of you know those guys in the class ahead of him, um, which is usually a good thing there. So I I'd love to see him. You know, if if you're trying to get spread around reps, and no disrespect to the older guys in front of him, but if you're trying to spread around reps, would love to see that and. Um, you know, would love to see Celine Wormley back for spring as well. I know we're talking bowl practices here, but uh, getting Wormley back could uh, could go a long way. 
The other position group, of course, in the spotlight for the wrong reasons on the ground, along with the offensive line, was the running back group. And on this topic, it's a strange subject because you've got guys who have been around the program for a bit. Um, and then you've got Keziah Holmes on the roster who was tucked away uh, for this entire season. And then, of course, Nick Singleton, Katron Allen weeks away. I really know how to answer this one on running back. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I mean, it's a, <laughs> the, the, the guys that the guys that need work are the guys getting the ball too. I mean, let's not act like this is a situation where you know you cut down on reps at one spot because a guy is cruising and you know at where he should be in his career. Um, Noah Kane, Kevon Lee, the guys at the top. I mean, they're just they haven't gotten it done either. So you know, I, I don't know how you split reps in this bowl practice. I don't know how you can get a guy like Holmes or. Um, you know, Lee's still a pretty young guy. Um, I don't know how you can get these guys to benefit until you get the uh, or before you get the January kids in um, who are both very talented. But, uh, yeah, you're, we're going to link these uh, offensive line and running back together for a long, long time. And and just there's I don't think there's an answer right now. I think words ring hollow a little bit on the, on this subject, on the ground game, on everything for everybody right now. But Noah Kane says that he feels like he's going to deliver his best performance of the season in the Outback Bowl. Says he has not been 100% this season. I don't think that necessarily changes, but he says the goal is for the running back room to have a bounce back game in its final seat game of the year. Everyone would love to see it, but there's been a lot of that kind of talk before 12 different games this year and just has not been able to come to fruition uh, for this group. Over in terms of pass targets, there's a lot you could go through here. Um, Malik Mega is the guy who made strides late, showed that big playability, trying to go from a superb athlete uh, to a sharp and wide receiver prospect. Uh, Jaden Dotton, uh, you know, it feels like it's really important for him to make a move right now before these next wide receivers get in with the freshman class, try to establish himself a bit. It seems like it went awry for him a little bit in that regard earlier this year. And then you got Harrison Wallace, who we heard good things about during preseason camp. Uh, Liam Clifford, of course. Sean Clifford told us he's excited to get a chance to go out and ball with him a little bit in 2022. So it, it, it's, you know, Jahan Dotson's show is about to come to an end. Parker Washington's a sensational player, and he's going to have to step up to wide receiver one. You could throw Keandre Lambert-Smith in this mix because he's still a work in progress. But clearly those starters – Daniel George and Cam Sullivan Brown are, are the, the the vets who you think are out the door as well, probably. And then there's this group that get ready for the next freshman class because they're going to be pushing you as well. Yeah, it's kind of the, the same situa situation we saw last year um, with uh, with guys like Mega and, of course, Norval Black's out. Jaden Dotton's in there now, too. Um, but uh, I think Mega's a guy that could really benefit from from added reps at bowl practice. We saw him as the year went on. He got hurt in camp and didn't play in the first, I think, six or seven games. Um, but he was able to get in there, caught the long touchdown in the, in the Rutgers game. Um, so just getting his feet wet and getting him going is something because this is a kid that still is learning the finer points of playing that position athletically. He's got everything you want. He's got that size that, that people really, uh, you know, seem to fawn over. Um, and I think he's, he's got potential, but, but I think he's got potential as a third guy at this, this time. Um, we will see how they handle the bowl prep with 12 personnel and maybe even throwing three tight ends out there with the way that Warren, Warren closed the season, excuse me. Um, but yeah, I think mega is going to definitely benefit from it. We will see if uh, Wallace can um, be another guy that steps in. We probably, I probably expected to see him a little bit more based on the feedback that we've gotten. Um, he's a guy that, that did need to get a little bit bigger, but at the same time, speed athleticism uh, is kind of on a different level from some of the guys at that tier. Um, so really looking forward to see what Trey Wallace can do. And if they play him Clifford, um, we talked uh, with Parker Washington or I talked talk with Parker Washington at media day said he's been working a lot out of the slot. I think I'm interested to see how that's going to go because he's a guy with great body control, um, you know, quickness more so than speed and, uh, and good hands. So I think that, you know, if you're trying to find a guy in that, in that role that can move the chains, Clifford is, a, is eventually going to be a guy that works his way into into a player at Penn State. So I would go with Mega there. I would go with Wallace in terms of the the, the high-level guy. Um, and then Clifford, we'll see. I mean, Dotton has just kind of been there. Um, he, mm -hmm. he hasn't separated himself from from any of those other guys. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm still curious about what his role is moving forward. Um, but Mega, I think, can, can have not only um, not only benefit from bowl practices, but also have an impact on the bowl game on January 1st. Penn State brings a couple of burners to campus at receiver in January as early enrollees. Caden Saunders, Omari Evans going to join this group. At tight end, Khalil Dinkins. What is he on the football field? Are you sure he's a tight end? This is me uh, emphasizing things for you, Mr. Fitz. you got a few more weeks to figure this out before you maybe 
adjust or double down on your plans for Khalil Dinkins for 2022 going into the winter. And then I'm still going to include Tyler Warren here because he didn't enroll early like Theo Johnson did last year. And I know things got scattered to the wind last spring semester, but Theo Johnson had head start there. Theo Johnson played more of the position than than Tyler Warren as certainly ever did coming out of high school. So I still think every practice is, is a step forward for Tyler Warren. I think we will see a lot of him in the bowl game. And I, I really want to see where it goes from here because the glimpses that we got from him, he could be a really special tight end. I don't know if it happens in 2022, but he is right along where you could ever hope he, he would be, you know, coming out of year two on campus. I think. I I, th- I think he's beyond where you would expect, and yeah. where would you hope you or even hoped he would be? I mean, obviously mm-hmm. he's always been an athletic kid, but being a high school quarterback who's never put his hand in the dirt playing uh, playing tight end, I mean, that's just a phenomenal output, and it showed. You know, they're putting him in a wildcat. They're they're throwing the ball down the field to him. They trust him too. So play all three of those guys. Make yourself a matchup, um, you know, a matchup nightmare. You've got Theo Johnson, who is as fast as some of your wide receivers. So uh, split those guys out. We'll see what happens. Uh, 12 personnel, 21 personnel, whatever you want to do in the bowl game to get those guys in the field. And if you're not playing with Dotson, then you've, you've got a chance to uh, tinker with some things and see how you can get going. It's, it's interesting that... Mike Yersich has never been a guy that has leaned on tight ends, but you kind of have to. When you got a group like this, mm-hmm. you kind of have to. And we saw Strange get back involved in the passing game in the last game of the season. So, um, yeah, might as well. I mean, when you look at uh, what you've got at receiver, you've got experience in Dotson and, and Keandre Lambert Smith. And then beyond that, um, you, you sure you've got experience with Cam Sullivan Brown, but you've got upside with those tight ends. So, wouldn't be shocked to, uh, to see them just try and lean on those guys, especially if you're trying to keep it. Uh, closer maybe trying to run the football a little bit more i know that's kind of a uh, oxymoron at this point with this football team but uh we'll, we'll see what happens there dinkins hey do we mention that linebacker room how how thin it is and how they need guys i would love to see that haven't heard of any moves definitely being made um but uh i would love to see it in terms of this is a kid that that put together that kind of film in high school on the defensive side of the ball moves like that guy um and it, just this is me just personally talking this isn't anybody that i talk to in the building would love to see him on the defensive side of the ball um especially with those three fairly young tight ends ahead of him yeah, jerry cross coming in uh, just around the corner here as well uh, a big tight end out of milwaukee uh going to be an early enrollee so that room will get better um and and sean we already spent a lot of time i think at linebacker talking about king and button and, and and the decision they'll face in the game but the practice reps and why they matter right now and uh, the other King, uh, Kalen King at defensive back and and, and Wheatley and Reed. Um, if you want to go over any of those again, that's great. But I think defensive line is, is really important, particularly here in the in the next week and a half for Penn State. Zariah Fisher off the edge, Fatoma Mulba inside, Amin Vanover, who's been a versatile component for them. And then Devon Townley. Um, this is more of one that building towards next spring conversation uh, because this is a guy that showed up. And, and early on, you could see, yeah, he, he, he looks like he just showed up from a high school campus. He had a length. He had size. By the end of the season, wasn't necessarily getting that vibe. I, I don't know if the staff has turned – feels like he's turned that kind of a corner. But in our very brief glimpses, I mean, there's some marked progression there, and that's not always the case because we don't get a lot of looks. Yeah, especially when you take a look at the guys that they've brought in uh, at defensive end. Right, uh, right. You know, we haven't heard much from Rodney McGraw. We haven't heard much or anything from Bryce Mostella. Townley's been a guy that's stepped up. I'm still not convinced. Uh, you know, he'll be on the edge. Um, you know, long term is a big freaking kid. Yes. Um, who came in very thick. Um, so he might be an interior guy eventually. Um, on the edge, you're looking at Fisher to make that step. You're looking at Smith Vilbert to potentially potentially start this game for Penn State and I yeah I know he's a too deep guy but that's a that's a pretty stark drop off from from where they were at with their starters um interior you know Vanover is a guy kind of like Townley started out at the end and and just might be too big for that um but uh you know you liked sort of the, some of the glimpses that he had um outside of that one BS penalty that he had for, for what game was that was that the Rutgers game or the Michigan game? Uh, it, was, it was a game where he got a he got penalized for something stupid pulled a, pulling a guy off a pile um so that was his biggest mark this year but uh when you take a look at the young guys you can't forget that uh, on the defensive line excuse me you can't forget that you've got Kaziah Izzard um mm-hmm. you've got Devon Ellis fairly young guys uh the a freshman and a sophomore they're going to start and they're going to be in the mix to start next year regardless of what Mustafer decides so um y- you like what they're building up in the long term um they might get some holes shot in them uh this uh this January 1st against Arkansas who's going to yeah. run the ball straight at them um but it's going to you're going to have to sort of grit your teeth and and, and use it as a learning experience 
Um, beyond that, with defensive end, we mentioned McGraw. We mentioned Mostella. I mean, uh, would like to, you know, McGraw was always going to be a guy that would take a couple of years. So we'll see what happens. Mostella, I, I don't know that I foresee him making an impact at this point at this level. Um, but uh, Townley is going to be interesting. And you know, you go back to that portal, and and you think that is probably a top priority you know linebacker and defensive end you can mix those those positions up and say that these are top priorities um but you're gonna have to find another guy at the edge that can get after the quarterback like they found uh with ebikiti last year who was just turning out to be an absolute or has turned out to be an absolute gem um for them in the portal last year yeah that was a that was a huge splash you're gonna need something similar or, or at least in that realm on the defensive front for Manny Diaz going into 2022. Um, and then I guess I, I will just mention the other King really quick here, Kalen King. Um, there's going to be a, a void there at the starting cornerback. You got Tariq Castro field setting out. Joey Porter Jr. I know a lot of folks, including us, wondered despite his status as a, you know, a quote unquote third year freshman this year with this, uh, with this athletic pedigree, with his arsenal and that, that, that length, could he actually consider leaving? Um, I thought over the course of this year, we saw the penalties rack up. We saw him, you know, certainly face some adversity. And I think right now you're thinking another year for, for Joey Porter Jr. as a third year cornerback. What could he do? Could he refine things? Regardless, though, Kalen King going to be a prominent factor, Sean. And to me, him versus Johnny Dixon, if that's the case, whatever it may be, uh, King's another guy who stands to, to, you know, use these next few weeks, show Terry Smith how far he's come along and finish strong because a lot of the guys that we hear great things about early on in the year. Then you'll hear they hit some kind of wall in November or December and they didn't finish strong. So if Kim and King go wire to wire, show up as the most prepared freshman that they've seen and then finish on a high note, I think that's going to signal a lot about what his future looks like here in Happy Valley. Yeah, he's going to factor into that starting role next year. I, I don't have any doubt about it. You know, John Dixon's going to be there um, as well. But uh, yeah, King, the way that he came in and he played as a true freshman, I thought he played well at times. But you know, that's a big, a big jump to make uh, to be a full time starter. So um, I think these bowl practices are big for him, uh, big for Zaki Wheatley, as I said. Uh, you know, he's still a corner at this point where we thought he might be a safety and make that transition. Um, curious to see if he's a guy that can see the field next year. You know, you're talking to some people in the program. They love what he brings to the table athletically, but uh, until you throw him out there, it's it's really tough to say. So um, in that defensive backfield, um, you might see an infusion of youth uh, with King and with Jalen Reed that back there at safety, but uh, they, they showed this year that they can hang. Let's jump over to our five-star mailbag and wrap this one up. Sean, we got a couple questions. The first one, uh, a, a fun one. We appreciate this one. I don't know how many hits that uh, page views it ended up at, but it was well over a million uh, for the defensive coordinator search that, that dominated the first half of December. And the question for us is, what was your favorite off-topic conversation in the defensive coordinator thread on that Lions 24-7 message board? I'll go first here, Sean, because there's plenty to choose from. I'm going to kind of flip it on its head. I thought my favorite part was that anything football-related or defensive coordinator search related became the off topic thing. I remember throwing something in from a James Franklin call that we had where he was shedding a little bit of light on what he was looking for. And it was almost like, Hey guys, don't mind me. I'm just, just, just wanted to drop this in. Cause I felt like I was interrupting a different kind of conversation and there was just a total community thing. Um, and I was like, you know, don't mind me, just some defensive coordinator tidbit. Uh, it, it, I thought that was funny that the actual football stuff became very much on the peripheral to what that had become. Oh, it was unbelievable. I mean, you look at, uh, you don't get organic material like that all that often. It just took off and it was off topic and, you know, at times seemed to be careening off the edge, but it was able to, to come <laughs> back and uh, credit to our posters at Lions 24-7 for, for bringing that back. Uh, it was I learned a lot, man. I learned uh, probably too much about some of our posters. Um, thanks for, for – we love you. But, yeah, we, we, we learned a little bit too much there. Um, I will say I got I did get my wife a weighted blanket because of it uh, for Christmas. I know she's not listening to this, so I can say that. Um, but that was very important. Learned a lot about the Sopranos. Learned a lot about – pretty much everything that you could think of went on in that thread. And it was funny because, because I was, I'm sitting there listening to James Franklin talk um, on, on uh, media day. And he's talking mm -hmm. about keeping everything in house, keeping the circle closed. I'm like, no shit, man. Like this was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, James Franklin coaching searches. I don't like, I don't like hot boards um, because they're, they're mostly fluff. I don't like doing all that stuff unless I have solid information. And, you know, we were, 
on top of a lot of information that turned out to be true. Um, but it, it's a very frustrating thing to try and follow a James Franklin led search because I've got people in that building texting me, asking me what I'm hearing. And it's just, it's a whole runaround type thing. But uh, that, that off topic thread, um, which was very on topic and, and, you know, we, Talked about Manny Diaz a couple of days before he was officially hired. Um, so there was actual football information in there. Um, but it was really, really interesting to, to, to find the stream of consciousness that you don't get um, on the Internet all that often because a lot of it's bickering and things like that. But it was a really I think it was something I was texting with somebody that that's on the board. That's a friend of mine. And he's like, this is something the board needed after that seven and five season that was just frustrating as all hell to watch. Um bringing that thing together and bringing that out really was, was cathartic for a lot of people and was able to get uh, people focused on the future rather than going back. And I know RMJ was in there talking about the offensive line, but going back and rehashing <laughs> the same things over and over and over again. So um, it was therapeutic. I thought it was, it was awesome um, in terms of what a message board should be and, and, and has the potential to be. I think it was everything that, that we wanted. I know people wanted uh, just straight information all the time injected into their veins that's not the way that these things happen. And that's, uh, and, and I think a lot of people in that thread were able to grasp that and run with it. Uh, awesome stuff. We appreciate the question and appreciate the strength of the community, which Sean has organically uh, developed himself here at Lions 24 seven. I'm just happy to be a part of it and get to witness something like that. Uh, occur you're just, here you're just the guy throwing the, the batch of newspapers <laughs> off the truck and yeah. just, here you go. And then just Don't going on. Yeah. Um, the next question uh, takes us back to, to football. Uh, and, and it asks us when it comes to attracting top players, from the transfer portal, are there any areas on the Penn State roster that are easier to sell than last winter? I'm going to steal one from you because I know that you've said it like three episodes in a row now. Arnold Abikede strengthens your case at defensive end. He went from Temple, where he was a solid player. I think he was second team all conference at Temple to a first team all Big Ten caliber player and a guy who's on every list of the top transfers in college football. I think right away, that's where I go to. And that's good because Penn State needs to go back to the well at that position. Yeah, and and going back to what James Franklin said about a quarterback in the portal, this was a month or two ago. It's so much easier to sell a spot that's not filled. Like you could, mm -hmm. like last year, if Penn State wanted to go after a quarterback, Sean Clifford, no matter what Penn State fans thought about him, no matter what Penn State fans were saying or anything like that, was the returning starter, at, even on paper. You know, So it would have been tough for a guy to process that. The guys that are in the portal, they want to play. They want to do, you know, it, it isn't about um, the alma mater. It isn't about the facilities and all that kind of stuff that the high school kids are looking at. It's about playing, putting themselves in the best position to make themselves make the leap to the NFL. And, and going into a position where you have a returning starter is going to be tough. Um, that's why, you know, even if they would have gone after, or even if they would have like heavily, I know they went after some quarterbacks in the portal last year, it would have been tough to eventually sign a guy like that. Um, moving on from that whole topic and trying to leave that one in the past, um, defensive end is absolutely the answer here. Um, and you could, you could say the same about linebacker and, and you could say the same last year, um, even though Curtis Jacobs wasn't a starter, but he was talking about him as a five-star guy coming in, going to start at Sam essentially that cost them Mike Jones who went from Clemson to LSU um, because you feel like you had starters in that situation in that scenario. And I think that might've been after the spring as well. I could, could have my timelines off there. So you look at the spots that are open defensive end, absolutely huge linebacker, absolutely gaping hole right there where you probably can sell that a little bit better to come in and start. I look at the offensive line, um, you know, you're losing potentially Walker and you look at what was trotted out there this year, Miranda, uh, you're going to lose as well. Um, so you have an opportunity. Hunter Norzad from, from Cornell, it's a guy they absolutely love. A lot of teams are catching onto that. I know Clemson's sniffing around. I know Iowa state or excuse me, Iowa offered um, last week as well. So a lot of these schools that we think of as offensive line schools hand quotes there, um, you know, are coming in and, and coming into the mix for Norzad. And he's uh, a guy that's probably going to take visits in the spring. He's a guy that, uh, excuse me, um, is probably going to take a visit or is going to take a visit to Penn State in, in, in January. Um, so he, the, the, that's where I'm looking right now is you've got an opportunity to, to, to upsell this offensive line, show them what you had last year, show them that you're losing numbers from last year. And, you, you know, this is a spot where you could step in and start. And I know what uh, and, and you could throw Eric Wilson in there as well. And I know Eric Wilson didn't live up to expectations for a lot of Penn State fans as a starter um, at, at left guard, even though he, he started 11 games this year. Um, but they showed that they will take a guy from the portal, 
put him in front of the guys that they recruited and, and start him. So I think that that's uh, something you could throw out there as well. Cause these kids, I don't think are going through and watching tape of Eric Wilson from last year to see if they would fit into that and see if that would be them next uh, at this point next year. Um, so you've got an opportunity to sell on that offensive line. I still think they probably would like to have two. They'd like to get Norzad and, and, you know, move them in there as a guard and have the, have the opportunity to start in the interior right there. And they'd love to have a tackle, whether that tackle would be ready right now or not. I, is really hard to say because looking at that portal and i know you i know penn state fans are are anxious and want penn state to to get in there and try and get theirs and there's some top level guys in the portal there's also a lot of crap i mean there's a, there's a lot of guys out there who are going to come in and i i don't want to to mess on the kid or anything like that but give you um the uh, production that John Lovett was able to give you last year. You know, that, that that's that's what you're looking at right now. So you're looking at guys that can come in, can be a starter, can be a high-level starter, maybe not an arm like Bikiti, um, but somewhere up on that level where it really, really uh, can can be productive for your team. So um, I don't think Penn State's behind at all, to be honest with you. Just uh, there's, there's a lot of things that are out there that are, you know, fool's gold essentially. Um, but, uh, I think that, that, that's going to be something where they have to continue to set, scout, continue to sell and eventually get these guys on campus. And that's another thing, um, while I'm talking myself in circles here, that's another thing when you're looking at, uh, transfers, potentially visiting, there's a window right before classes start. I believe it's seven days before classes start where you can have guys on campus, even though it is technically a dead period. Um, so we will see where Penn State is able to sneak these guys in, whether it's for January. Norzad's a, uh, a May graduate. Uh, he's going to get his degree from from Cornell and, and then uh, in, enroll at the school of his choice after the spring. Um, but, yeah, I think the movement is probably going to start later in this month and early in January. What's with these Ivy League guys trying to finish their degrees before they, they get to their Big Ten school or their next school? I just I can't wrap my head around it, man. Um, when, when, when we you... spent the entire offseason <laughs> last year making that joke. Let's just let's retire it. Put it up. Maybe I'll put it up on the shelf here, um, and then uh, just to, we'll move on from it. But yeah, I mean, what 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 are, what are they thinking? I thought with Spencer Rollin, we were moving on from it, but clearly, you know, the the Ivy League lineman infatuation continues here, and we'll keep talking about it. And Sean, when you talk about a, a position for me, I just got to say wide receiver. Uh, wide receiver. This is not necessarily one because there's a clear open spot to fill, although. You need to replace one of the top receivers in the country. It's just in general, I think, when you look at where that position was during early years of the transfer portal, it was K.J. Hamler and then a cliff dive for a couple of years when you looked at just postseason production. And people weren't watching Jahan Dotson's sophomore year highlights to get to, to get a look. You're right. It, it's about, okay, you had this many full-time stars who came in as a transfer. You had three of them last year. If you can sell that possibility at wide receiver where you've had success, Parker Washington, I think, is obviously a slam dunk starter for you. I think Keandre Lambert-Smith is probably close to that. And there's a lot of ascending figures who could jump up and become breakout players, but it's a, it's a spot where you've seen Penn State be able to support at least two high-level productive wide receivers back-to-back -back years now. And then you kind of tacked on a third where Keandre Lambert-Smith played enough of a role where people can see, okay, th there's a spreading of the wealth. You've got a known commodity at quarterback in Sean Clifford, who was the guy for Jahan Dotson all these years. So to me, if there's a, a kind of one that you go big game hunting a little bit, maybe aim higher than, than you have a shot with, I'd see what you can do a wide receiver. Can you talk yourself into a situation where guys coming from an offense that he felt was underwhelming, didn't have the right fit here, maybe sees a fit, knows he has a quarterback who's played a lot of football in Sean Clifford, knows he has an offensive coordinator and a wide receivers coach that have proven to put together productive wide receiver groups, not just wide receiver one, but number two and number three as well. And I think that's a spot where, um, you know, maybe you can find a special talent uh, and, and convince them that this is their launch pad towards enhancing their NFL draft stock. They're not a guy that had 12 catches at his last school, someone that maybe led their last team in receptions. And now they want to take that next step. Yeah. And, and I, I'm glad you said that last thing because I was about to hit you with a yes, but because it's not yes. about the guy leaving Clemson. It's not about the guy leaving Ohio State. It's not about those guys um, that, that haven't lived up to it and are just looking for a fresh start. You're looking at guys that are looking to maximize their their draft potential by leaving. You know, Penn State uh, is after Mitchell Tinsley from Western Kentucky. And if anybody watched that Western Kentucky bowl game, 
kid's a baller, man. You can find guys at that level. And he had 80 catches this year and 1200 yards receiving and things like that. Um, you can find guys at that level that are looking to, to make that leap. And that's, those are the guys you got to find. Uh, what was it? Texas El Paso, um, had a, had a receiver go in earlier this week. I mean, you're, you're looking for number one, a guy that can hold up athletically and excel athletically in your program. Um, a lot of those guys fall through the cracks and end up at schools like Texas El Paso and Western Kentucky. And I'll be interested to see if Tinsley follows uh, the offensive coordinator to Texas Tech, which I think is the plan for a lot of the the Western or a couple of the Western Kentucky guys. Um, but yeah, you're you're trying to find a guy that can be explosive um, and get you to the next level, rather than taking you know just a a guy that you're looking to repurpose from mm -hmm. maybe what you thought he was as a high school prospect or something like that. And maybe maybe you do find a guy like that, but at the same time. You love to get production. You would love to get explosion. You love to get faster at that wide receiver spot. And and a guy like Mitchell Tinsley at Western Kentucky, um, while the, it, it might not be the flashiest name out there, is really what you're looking for in terms of an evaluation. Other than you know this guy was uh, an all uh, you know whatever conference you want to say uh, a pick or something like that. So be interesting to see where they go at that position. But I do agree with you that wide receiver is a spot where they not only they can sell. Um, but also they can they can find a guy. There's bound to be some news that pops up between now and our, ne our next episode. As we said, this is it before Christmas from us. Um, so follow everything at lines247.com, the opt-out news, the transfer portal. Um, if coaching carousel stuff pops up, you can find it all there at lines247.com. Woke up on a Wednesday, Sean, and was worried that we would have enough to fill an episode 50 minutes later. We did just that. Uh, wishing you and the Fitz family an awesome Christmas and our producer Lance Glenn as well. Uh, yeah, wishing all of our listeners a, a, a Merry Christmas. And uh, you, I know, are on the road. Uh, you're yes. going to find that with the new baby that eventually you're going to want to settle at some point. Uh, but I think we did our first Christmas on the road and then we decided, yeah, I think we're, we're good to wake up in our own house uh, the next year. So um, a Merry Christmas to you and the wife and, of course, uh, young Olive as well. Um, thank but, you. yes, thank you to everyone for sticking around and listening as, as long as we've been on for this one. I know this was this is going to be the one that's going to have to get you through till after Christmas. We'll be back with you <laughs> next week. But, uh, yes, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to everybody that, that, that has listened to us all year long. And as Tyler said a couple of episodes ago, got us over a million downloads, which is an astronomical number. Our boss is very happy with that. I don't know what it means, um, but I know that that, the, that means you guys are listening. So despite the seven and five record, uh, we we are um, as popular as we've ever been. And we're grateful for for your listenership all year long. And even if it's just to see the moose mug, head over to YouTube and follow us at Lions 24 seven uh, for all the episodes uploaded there in video format. We'll talk to you real soon. I'm Tyler. He's Sean. This is the Lions 24 seven podcast.